Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm. Um, oops. Uh, still getting over a cold. Uh, as a Canadian I'm, Canadian, I'm still getting used to the harsh Melbourne winters. Um, that's a joke. But they really aren't that bad, although we do have better central heating in Canada. Um, yeah, so developing cloud service in the cloud. Uh, lots of buzzword bingo there, but you know, this is the age we live in. Um, I'm the founder of Slick DNS. It's a small startup, basically DNS hosting. Um, you know, check it out. It's, I host two, ma two domains for free and um, a 30 day free trial. So check it out, tell your friends. So this is a two part talk. Uh, the first part, part one, the cloud computing revolution. I really think that is, it's an overused word, but I think it's appropriate. Or if you went to this morning's talk, you might even call it a paradigm shift. Uh, part two, tips and tricks for developing a cloud service in Python, in particular with Amazon Web Services. Um, so the first will be somewhat abstract, more from the business economic point of view. Uh, the second will be, again, a bit of a grab bag, um, a bit of code, mostly just tricks I've learned developing SlickDNS in particular, but other web applications as well, um, going back uh, a fair way. Um, so there's a lot of material I'll try and cover it fairly quickly, but there'll be time for questions at the end. Otherwise, I'm around you know, today and tomorrow, so feel free to come up and say hello and, and um, ask me anything, uh, anything you want. OK, let's get going, shall we? Oh, yeah, so Python's been my language of choice for the last 10 years. I developed quite a few things in it, uh, web applications, um, starting with Zope way back when. That's dating me. Uh, I developed a distributed file system for movie restorations in California for a company called Lowry Digital uh, that developed or uh, restored uh, probably, I think now, even hundreds, at the time, dozens of classic movies, including most of Disney's back catalog, so Jungle Book, um, Lady in the Tramp, um, i trying to think of our code names. What was that? Snake Lady. Anyway, uh, then I worked for a company that called Ixia that does network testing simulation. I think they have some, it's basically for big switches, you know, so a company like Cisco makes a claim that their switch can handle so many hundred thousand simultaneous users, and how do they test that when well, they come to companies like Ixia? Um, and then uh, most recently, the stays up until the end of 2010, I worked um, with PIMCO, which is an investment management firm, developing a grid compute system for their, managed, for their investment management modeling. So that's why I was at the previous talk about uh, NumPy, because uh, a lot of quants like using NumPy. Um, although I have different opinions and perhaps the validity of their models, but anyway, that's a separate issue. Uh, so way back when, I started off in COBOL, that paid my um, student loans off, and then I left COBOL off my resume. Uh, I've also done some C++, uh, C Sharp, Tickle, JavaScript. And most recently, I've also started playing with Go, which is a very interesting language I'm also happy to talk about. Coincidentally, at Ixia, uh, I worked with Python, Tickle, C++, C Sharp in the same process. That's fun to debug. And somewhere in there, there was also an in-process Corbo server. So that was a very interesting program to work on. OK, cloud computing, uh, the revolution. So to give you some context, almost exactly 10 years ago in Vancouver, Canada, I set up a Zop hosting business called Lane Street Labs. It's now running under the name Zoptopia. Um, these were my costs. I, I still have the invoices, so I looked them up. A 1.13 gigahertz Pentium 3, 256 megs of RAM, uh, three hard drives for a RAID 6 config configuration cost me almost $2,800 up front. The co-location hosting with, I think, Pier 1 or Pier 3, $250 a month for 10 gigabytes of bandwidth. So clearly, I am not a very good negotiator. <laughs> if I was paying even then $25 per gig, uh, of bandwidth. Okay, so that's just 10 years ago. I mean, granted, hardware is a lot cheaper, but all the same, those are still fairly hefty numbers. Uh, today's costs. Servers basically start at around $15 a month from the mainstream cloud computing providers, which is to say Amazon, Rackspace, Linode, a Ninefold here in Australia, 
I, I checked their websites, around $15. Um, the context, I mean, that's one hour at Australia minimum wage, right? So for one hour at minimum wage in Australia, you can rent your own personal server in the cloud for an entire month, right? It's only going to get cheaper, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, bandwidth, uh, Amazon incoming bandwidth is free. Outgoing bandwidth is around 12 cents um, a gigabyte. A Linode with a $20 a month server, they throw in 200 gigabytes free. So, um, you know, I serve a lot of DNS queries, but I don't even worry about my cap. You know, it's, for me, it's, it's free. So again, that's 200 to 250 times cheaper than my costs were in 2002. Uh, so let's, I guess, define, it's, so cloud computing is a bit nebulous, but I suppose we have different layers. So start the physical layer, that's essentially renting virtual servers, or the acronym, somewhat ugly, is infrastructure as a service. Uh, so the big players would be Amazon you know, EC2, which stands for Electric Compute Cloud, uh, Linode, see Rackspace, Nightfold here in Australia, uh, Google uh, Compute Engine, it's in beta. Anyone get an invitation? I tried, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't get in anyway. So Google Compute Engine is essentially comparable to Amazon EC2. I also manage development platforms. This is be platform as a service. Um, Heroku, I think they're presenting here. They're certainly a sponsor. Um, Gondor.io, uh, that's a, I think, Django-specific um, platform, hosting platform. Then there's also Google App Engine, which... Um, obviously developed by Google, that's basically um, the, the original language that App Azure was released for was Python, and since then they've added Java, and more recently they added Go. So that basically is, I, I like to think of um, development platforms as basically you cannot be the system administrator. Right? In other words, all you do is upload your code, and they, they manage the running of the application, and they completely, are, they are responsible for the uptime of the servers. So you cannot SSH into, into their servers. But well, if you can, uh, something's wrong. Um, okay. So basically, with, with you know, a platform like Heroku or App Engine, uh, they are the system administrators. Whereas with a platform like Amazon EC2 or Linode or Rackspace, someone has to install the software. In my case, it's me. Uh, in, in the bigger operation, you might have dedicated system administrators. But the point is, the responsibility for maintaining the uptime of that service is, is placed on you, whereas with a platform like Gondor it's, or Heroku, it's, it's on them, which becomes abundant whenever Amazon EC2 goes down and takes down Heroku uh, or other comparable providers. So th that's the risk. And then we have uh, Pure Software as a Service, or SAAS. I guess Salesforce.com, probably not aimed to towards the developers so much as say, um, I don't know, sales folks, uh, would be the original big ticket, uh, pure software service play. It's also Google Apps. I mean, this presentation itself is a Google Apps presentation. Um, then you have hosting providers at like Bitbucket, uh, which I personally use and like, and GitHub too. Uh, 37 Singles Basecamp, that's a um, it's project management uh, pack, uh, web service so that you can use to coordinate work. So I, I used it quite extensively, for example, with my graphic designer for Slick DNS. So he would upload screenshots and I'd say, you know, I like this or that and can you pl please change this? So it worked very well. And then of course, Slick DNS itself is you know, providing DNS as a service. So you do not have to worry about installing DNS servers and maintaining them and so on. Um, it's a quick and dirty definition. Predictions are hard. So in 2002, suppose someone had, had posed this question. In 10 years, who would be the world's single biggest computing infrastructure provider? Right? So the obvious answers at the time would have been IBM, HP, Sun, Dell, EDS. The answer, of course, is Amazon. Right? And they were joiners, Amazon, but they're just a retailer. All they do is sell books, DVDs, SpongeBob, underpants. They really do, I looked it up. Uh, they don't even make computers. That's not fair, right? right? Amazon does not make, well, uh, certainly at the time they didn't, they might, they might now make computers, but think about that, right? The world's single biggest computing infrastructure provider does not make their own computers, branded computers. There was uh, an interview last month with CNET 
uh, with Jonathan Schwartz, the last CEO of Sun before it was subsumed into Oracle. Very inter interesting quote. So you have IBM and HP and a whole bunch of other companies saying, oh wow, let's hang out with Morgan Stanley, that's a US investment bank, and sell them a computing cloud, wrong answer. Now you have nine months of a procurement process, three months with the security department, four months with the IT group that's in charge of making the decision, and Amazon just got another 200,000 customers. That's a very, I wouldn't say that's an exaggeration. Um, you know, that is actually what has happened, because some of these other companies in reaction to Amazon's dominance of the industry have you know, tried to come up with their own um, cloud platforms. And I remember one, I won't name the name because I can't remember and it would embarrass them anyway. But so I went to their cloud computing webpage and I wanted to know how much does this cost? Where do I sign up? So you click on the link and you know, it said call us. So I clicked the call us link and it was a 404. <laughs> yeah, which, <laughs> and that's their official launch page. You know, so it's like no wonder they were struggling to keep up. Um, <laughs> anyway, so obviously Jonathan Schwartz realizes that Sun too made the same mistake, which probably explains why Sun is no longer around. So again, the reason for why a company like Amazon can dominate the space is because data center, data center infrastructure is a commodity. All the chips for AMD 64, you know, 64-bit Intel, operating system Linux, um, even the, the virtualized operating system typically is open source, um, you know, where that's Zen, uh, th I think that's what um, Amazon uses un under the hood. Even the networking gear is increasingly white label, you know, so they won't, uh, certainly uh, Google and Amazon, Google certainly, Amazon probably do not buy uh, name branded switches. They d Google certainly designs them in-house and has them manufactured by the same companies in Taiwan and China that make the gear for all the big boys. And it's very, very cheap. Um, again, compared to my 2002 server costs. And if you think, think it's cheap now, wait till ARM ships 64 bit in volume. Right? I mean, an Intel chip retail goes for what, one to 200 bucks, whereas the chips and all the iPads that you're holding are probably retailed at under five. Right? So this is a huge price uh, margin that companies like Intel in particular are picking up now that will likely go away when ARM starts shipping 64 a bit. So the point is, I mean, it's, it's a very tough business to be in because you have to, to be a cloud player, you have high fixed costs in terms of you know, very specialized personnel. Um, you know, you have having to build the physical data structures by all the machines. Um, so really, it's only profitable, and it's low margin, so really it's only profitable at a very, very large scale. Okay, so let's imagine an imaginary conversation with my bank before I wanted to start Slick DNS. So I go in and say, how can I help you? I'd like to start a business, but first I need to build a global network of regionally redundant data centers, hire a team of expert system administrators and network operators to work around the clock, develop a suite of massively scalable, redundant, reliable web services. Can I borrow $100 million? <laughs> they would probably answer no. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Security. <laughs> right? Okay, let's okay, we keep that in mind. That's absurd, right? Okay? That's, you go to the cloud provider. Hi, how can I help you? You say, I hear you have, and so on. A global network of regionally redundant data centers, a team of expert system administrators and network operators working around the clock, a suite of massively really scalable, redundant, reliable web services. Mind if I use your cloud? Do you have a credit card? Yes. Let's do business. Right? Same thing, different answer. Why? Again, going back to Jonathan Schwartz's comment about Amazon. Amazon was used, because they're a retailer, right? All you need. All they want from you is your credit card number to take your money. Right? Whereas the old way, the way of say, HP, IBM, Dell, and now X Sun was to send in their sales force. Right? Do the dog and, show, uh, dog and pony show. Right? The whole process. Right? Trying to milk them. I mean, you know, like I was obviously screwed with my bandwidth contract paying $250 a month for you know, space that big and 10 gigs of bandwidth. Right? 
but that's because that's what the model was. But if you show your price list up front, there is no negotiation. There is no sales force, right? This is, this is the price list. Here's your credit card. Let's do business, which is essentially, essentially what I do. <laughs> you know, so if you like my price list, go ahead. I'll take your credit card. If you don't, well, too bad. Anyway, um, so again, a, a brief interlude into accounting. For the nerd, and most of us are, I don't use that as a pejorative. Um, what is cloud computing? It's my very own server on the internet running. A custom Gen 2 kernel. Django tricked out with Nginx. Node.js. Right, that's what all the cool kids are doing, and so on. Okay. It is lots of fun, right? I exaggerate, but not much. Okay. For the accountant, what is cloud computing? Zero upfront capital cost, right? Low operating costs. The pain is scaling of resources with demand, which means you don't have to worry about forecasting, right? That's what budgets are all about, is forecasting demand, right? But if you can basically automatically scale demand of your application with use, and obviously, presumably, use corresponds to with revenue, then what's the problem, right? You don't have to worry, there is no risk. More often than not, accountants are in charge, especially of the money. Right, so learn to think like an accountant, less like a technologist or a pure technologist. Again, who's winning? Is it IBM or HP or Dell or Sun or Oracle or is it Amazon? Okay, cloud computing in a single world, for, in a single word from my perspective is leverage. Yeah, leverage, uh, granted, since the global financial crisis uh, has been sullied, for example, by these guys. You know, subprime RMBS traders, Lehman Brothers, crazy Americans. Couldn't happen in Australia, right? Unless you're a negatively geared Australian property investor. Use the word loosely. Um, that's bad leverage. Good leverage. Renting an on-demand service in multi-million dollar data centers with your personal credit card. Right. Not having to sign a contract. Right. I mean, what the maximum upside is your, your credit card limit. Right. Worst case. Right. And on top of that, the cloud enables new classes of applications. It's something I thought about somewhat, but you know, I'm sure this can be explored further. For example, Google Apps. Um, as I say, I mean, this presentation is an example of something I was able to start in Melbourne and in theory, I could have switched to anyone's computer with my Gmail login and continued. And if you've ever collaboratively edited the same document in Google Apps, it's almost magic the way it works. I mean, I've done it. because so I was writing a long uh, technical document, and uh, I did most of the content, and someone else jumped in towards the end and started fiddling with the styling. You know, so they'd change the global background, or they'd add a footer. And there I was editing away, and suddenly, boom, the, part, the page had changed. But it, it worked. You know? I mean, there's some pretty heavy-duty math in terms of the synchronization algorithms that make that work. But it is only possible in a cloud environment whereby you're transparently accessing a remote computing resource. Right? I mean, all the complexity is hidden from you. Right? I mean, certainly, that's not something, well, it would, it's not really feasible even if our two computers are connected over the same local network. Because you still need the central coordinating uh, logic. And Tinkercad, how many, have any of you heard of Tinkercad? Yeah, OK. I see a maker in the crowd. Um, it, look it up. It's, it's a cool application. Basically, it's a, um, it's a solid modeling CAD for you know, 3D printing uh, devices. So the, the GUI runs in the browser. Uh, it's WebGL. Um, and the geometry calculations are done literally on a cluster, um, you know, obviously out there in the cloud. So the geometry calculations are actually extremely computationally expensive. So this is not something that you could feasibly run on your desktop machine. Or if you, if you did, it would be much slower than it actually is. So this is actually one good example of an application that's actually faster in the cloud because you have the relatively thin interface of the browser, but then you can harness as much CPU horsepower as you need in the, in the back end. Um, anyway, check it out. It's, it's a neat application. Okay, so that's a, a quick and dirty survey of uh, the cloud. Again, just think of the shift right, from my high upfront capital costs uh, 10 years ago 
um, you know, to the, again, from uh, upfront cost of around $3,000, fixed upfront capital cost, uh, operating cost of $250. I get the same thing nowadays with no upfront capital cost for 15, you know, $15 a month. Right, just quite an extraordinary shift. Okay, so tips and tricks for developing cloud service in Python. Okay, just a summary of Slicky NS. Again, I'm not, this is fairly generic. I mean, it's, it's part of my point is that the, or the Python infrastructure is mature enough now that you know, there's not too much guesswork about what a good stack is. Uh, so the primary server runs uh, Amazon EC2 in uh, Virginia, which is East Coast US, primarily because that gives me good latency with North America and Europe, where most of my customers are. Um, the database is MySQL hosted in relational RDS, relational database service. This is basically a service that Amazon provides whereby they run a redundant slave MySQL database. I suppose I could have set that up myself, but I couldn't be bothered, frankly. And I'd, I'd, I'm scared that I wouldn't do it properly so that when one machine went down, then, then my database would also go down. All right, so this basically is... You know, it's a continuum whereby, I mean, I obviously I'm capable of setting up MySQL myself, uh, uh, maybe in a non-cluster context, but in a cluster context, I'm less confident of my ability, so I can outsource that system administration expertise, if you like, to Amazon. Uh, the software is Django, uh, proxy behind Nginx, runs Celery, the task queue, and memcache for um, uh, backend server cache. Uh, the name servers hosted with Linode. Um, they're physically in New Jersey, USA, California, USA, East Coast, West Coast, London, UK, and Tokyo, Japan. In fact, right now, if the Wi-Fi is working, you can, in under 20 minutes, uh, sign up yourself to get four servers in New Jersey, California, London, Tokyo, 15 minutes. Uh, that's with Linode. With Amazon, you can sign up and get, probably the next 10, 15 minutes, servers running in Singapore, Tokyo, California, Oregon, Virginia, Ireland, and Sao Paulo. Because that, I think, is where the Amazon data centers are uh, around the world. I might have missed a couple. Right. But the point is, you can trivially um, start up um, servers that are physically close to your customers for good latency and good performance. Um, obviously, you can, well, it's difficult. You can't do that with co-location, but I think it would be prohibitively expensive and uh, very time-consuming to fly to all those locations. So I'm very aware because I'll be flying to LA in two days and I'm dreading that 14-hour flight. Uh, so third-party services I use, Postmark, that's email delivery. Um, I guess you can run your own email server, but generally speaking, deliverability is poor in this, the age of spam, so it's better to outsource that to a uh, email service provider that you know, reaches out to the ISPs to uh, guarantee better deliverability. Stat Hat and AWS CloudWatch I'll talk about in more detail. That's basically used for logging. Here's a rough, um, not a designer, obviously, uh, diagram. So essentially, uh, customers configure their DNS information with the web server, slickdns.com, and then that is pushed out to the four name servers, which are then queried by the internet. So Django, a quick um, overview of Django. How many have used Django or are aware of it? Good. Um, okay, most of you. How many have used other uh, um, Python web development platforms like Flask or Bottle or Zoop? Zoop, guys. Don't be shy. I don't know, Daddy ourselves, right? Anyway. Um, yeah, so a quick review of Django. Uh, models, views, uh, templates. The ORM, in my opinion, is Django's killer feature. Right, the rest, you know, templates and um, views, I think other packages handle fairly well. But the ORM basically is a SQL generator. And it's pretty darn efficient. There's been some nice, um, if, nice improvements with Django 1.4 in particular, whereby you can basically pull in related objects automatically in a single query, so you're not having to do related queries in the background. Uh, it's also SQL database agnostic. You know, so you can just start by developing SQLite, then deploy to MySQL and Postgres. One slight disadvantage of the, that approach maybe is that I'm personally a fan of Postgres, 
but I'm, you'll notice I'm deploying with MySQL because that's basically what Amazon provides. But with Django, basically, since I'm not writing the SQL, I don't care what the database is. Just provided it, it works. So, you know, that, that's a good thing, right? And I would say that Postgres is objectively a better database, but with Django, I don't care because it does all this, the dirty work for me. And generally speaking, with SQL, uh, with, with the Django ORM, I found very occasionally I have to um, branch out to raw SQL, but typically, especially by using Django, uh, Django Debug Toolbar, if you are not using that and you're developing in Django, start using that immediately. It's an excellent tool. Gives you excellent visibility into where your time is being spent, especially at the SQL layer. You know, it literally gives you a nice little graph of, of how long each query is taken. You, you drill down to the longest query, speed it up, and, and uh, hopefully that's your application somewhat optimized. Now, security in Django out of the box is excellent. Um, you know, if you do any reading about recent attacks of, or, or um, attacks on password databases, you'll realize the importance of password hashing and, and salting which is provided by Django out of the box by default. Um, and they, they use good hashes. Again, cryptography is something that's very difficult for non-specialists to get right, so that can be provided for you out of the box. That's a very good thing. You can ask uh, Sony about that. Um, other security holes that Django protects you against SQL injection. Uh, again, that's basically the ORM. I don't know, I mean, I haven't heard of SQL injection attacks recently in Django, or ever. Or it'd be extremely difficult to do so. Um, and then cross-site request forgery, again, it's built into default with form submissions. Uh, the admin, it's pretty, it's okay for bootstrapping um, and for back-end admin, but I wouldn't necessarily pre present the admin interface to the end user in terms of style. Uh, it has a built-in caching framework. It works very well with memcache, as I'll describe in depth later. It can be complex, uh, but so is the real world. I mean, I, I found that typically, you know, features in Django, you know, they're, they're not provided arbitrarily. They're, they're provided to solve a real problem that someone has encountered in the real world. Right? So I'm skeptical of claims to say, well, here's a nice little framework. It does everything you need uh, until you actually start to develop something for the real world. I'm not saying Django's perfect, I'm saying it's good, you know. Um, and we're lucky to have it. Okay, so Django deployment. Again, this is just a grab bag of tips, but you know, I found them to be useful. So first is use virtual ENV. So even if you just have a single application, which I do, use it because it provides an isolated Python environment. Um, and if you use it in conjunction with pip, Python installer package, I forget what the acronym stands for. Basically, it, it enables you to easily track your third-party dependencies for your application. You, you know, so every time you add a package, you just do pip freeze, dump it to your um, requirements text file, and save that to your uh, version control system. Of course, it's a given that you're using version control. <laughs> I would hope in this day and age, which is why I haven't explicitly said so. Uh, G Unicorn, again, a production WSGI uh, WSGI server. Uh, which I proxy behind Nginx or Apache uh, to serve these static files. Again, this is all convention, but you know, uh, it works for good reason. Daemon tools, uh, start and monitor services. For example, if my server goes down, I want Celery and Django to come back automatically. Uh, with Daemon tools, I can do that in sort of a one-line script. Uh, equivalent with Supervisor D, um, I think it's written on Python. Although I find the configuration file more complex than I need, so I'm quite happy with daemon tools. Are there any other equivalents I'm missing? Uh, just upstart. Hmm? Upstart. upstart. Okay, that's I think started in Ubuntu, right? But it runs on pretty much everything now. Dem, dem yeah. Today, okay. Yeah. Although I was, yeah, okay. I think that's probably more powerful. I was confused what all the run levels were, so I, I stayed with the daemon tools, but anyway. <laughs> hmm. yeah, okay. Whatever, whatever works. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not. Yes. <laughs> as long as it starts your service, and if it stops, restarts it. Yeah, that's basically all you need. Uh, Fabric, uh, this is invaluable for me to automate remote deployment. Um, 
Essentially, fabric means you never have to leave the comfort of your local host terminal, especially if you're connected to a server as I am on literally the other side of the world, where ping times can be somewhat annoying if you're typing. Um, so I find what I do with Fabric is that I, for example, remember I have four name servers, so typically I want to install, uh, I want them all essentially to be clones of each other. So typically if I'm installing something new, I'll install it manually in one name server. Then when I verify that it works, I'll wrap that un into a, a function which I'll put into the Fabric fab file. I then run that in parallel on, the, on all the name servers. Right? So, you know, it's, it's a very useful tool. So if you're not, again, using Fabric and you're deploying to, even to a single server, but especially if you're deploying to multiple servers, you know, look it up. Um, it can be fairly involved, but, you know, the, uh, it, it is certainly worth it. Um, uh, Celery. Um, seems to be standard in the Python world. It's basically an asynchronous task queue based on distributed message passing. Um, it can use the Django database, but the recommended configuration, the one I use, is to use RabbitMQ, which is a message server written in coincidentally in Erlang, I think. Um, anyway, it basically, um, a message queue, you basically push a job onto the queue, which then returns immediately. Then that job is processed or pulled off the queue, and when it's um, completed successfully, it's pulled off the queue. So the point is it handles, uh, it guarantees that messages or jobs are executed, right? So they're only deleted when they're actually executed and completed. Some uses, some things I use salary for are responsive form handling. Uh, so for example, I have a support form on the CKNS website. Um, that basically sends an email, but when they hit submit, I respond immediately and I say thank you for submitting a support request. We'll be getting back to you as soon as possible. Or words to that effect. But in the background, I've posted the content of the form submission uh, to Celery and then that is sent in the background uh, as an email. Right? So that you have a better user experience. You know, even if the email takes only a second or two, the user still notices that versus returning the form submission, say, a tenth of a second. Right? So that's one good thing for it. Another thing is logging. Uh, for example, when I update the name servers, I'm interested in how long the start to end update is of all the name servers, of all four is. So I want to log that time. So basically, so updates, it's basically a ping. So the, the web server pings the name server saying, hey, there's a new version of the DNS database. Come and get it. The name servers turn around and call a URL over HTTPS, so it's secure. And when all four have... Um, retrieve the latest version of the DNS database, then I log an event measuring the complete elapsed time. So that is good for metrics, because you can say, well, I want, you want to target, say, a certain update time, say five seconds. So if it goes consistently above 10, 15, or whatever, then you know that something's wrong and you can look into it. And um, you can also run a task on every page load. In fact, I do this, let me just see if I can switch back. Oh, never mind. I'll have to show you later. Um, if you go to the CTNS homepage, you'll see on the bottom left a counter of all the DNS queries that are served. It's currently at around 77 million. Um, so on every page load, basically, I kick off a little salary task then that pulls all the name servers, adds up the number of queries served, and shoves it into memcache. So the next time the page is loaded, I can pull that value directly out of memcache, right? So the value is accurate, but then there's no lag for the user, right? So that really is, is, is the goal. Uh, to my mind, the, the, probably the, the best use of using a, a back-end queue handling system. So you provide good performance, um, but you, you, know, you can also run necessary tasks. Uh, server caching, memcache. You know, it's a one-line install, literally, on Ubuntu. Right? No brainer. Uh, Again, Django provides good caching support by default. Uh, one little trick I like to do is basically cache all pages in the site for anonymous users. Right, it's a very easy win. Right. Who's your most important anonymous user? Search engine, right? And uh, search engines typically will rank your site higher if response is good. Right, so you want to cache pages as much as possible. So add these lines and Basically, all pages for anonymous users, which is to say non-logged-in users, are cached for five minutes. Again, easy win. 
Uh, this is another nice little trick on um, browser caching. Remember, this caching can be either on the server, which is memcache, or it can be on the browser. Um, again, if you look at the, th the source to NSDT and this web page, you'll see that the media URLs are prepended by a timestamp. So basically, I calculate that timestamp every time the server is restarted. So the timestamp is the timestamp of the static media file that was most recently touched. Right? So that then becomes the prefix for all static media URLs across the site. And I'll publish this. It's a, a trivial bit of code, but newest mtime.py. It's a gist there in GitHub. Um, and I'll publish these slides soon. And Nginx on the other end, basically it's, it says, well, if any static media file starts with a timestamp URL, then set the expiry time to maximum, which is a century out. I don't know, but it's a long time, right? Which basically says never invalidate this value. Um, here's a nice piece of wisdom from Peter B on Hacker News. Invalidation is for suckers. A fresh new URL is much safer, right? Because otherwise you're guessing, well, you know, if this, if this particular image can update, what's the safe value to put half an hour? Who knows? What if it's a, what if it's a site logo and somehow it's screwed up? Right? Then suddenly you're, you're loading a bad site logo for the next half hour. So, you know, so if it can change your URLs any time any static media file changes, then, you know, to my mind, that's a very effective approach. Remember, on the, on the, on the client side, uh, the cache, I think it's least recently used, so basically, as the cache fills up, stuff that hasn't been touched in a while is basically thrown out. So if you just change the URL, you're always getting the most uh, up-to-date files. Impersonate your users. Um, this is actually for their benefit, because it means you can see exactly what they are seeing in the browser. So I do this in SlickDNS. Basically, the idea is that um, you allow staff users to select a, say, paying customer from a drop-down list. Uh, when you do that, their username is injected into the staff user session. Then every time you load a page, check to see for the existence of that customer's username in the session. If it's there, then you retrieve uh, their account's data. Right? So for example, for my customers, uh, when I'm impersonating them, I'm retrieving their domains or their servers or their settings. Right? So when they call up for help, I can see exactly what they're seeing in their own browser. So it's, uh, it's a little trick, and I think it's quite useful. But the template logic's all the same, right? The template logic doesn't care where the objects come from. Um, it just renders them the same. Although, do be sure to uh, put in a nice red warning, as I do at the top. You are impersonating so-and-so. Please be careful with what changes you make. <laughs> Adding an API. Um, you could go with SOAP, but by doing so, you have elected the way of pain. Uh, on the right there we have Saruman and uh, Gandalf, in a way. Uh, also a very good essay, the S stand for simple. Have any of you read that? <laughs> yes, yes, I see some. Uh, good luck. Anyway, but, but f unfortunately sometimes your customers might ask for soap. So uh, you have my sympathy, but I'm afraid I can't give you any tips. Um, the better way to add an API is to use REST, or representational state transfer. Basically, REST, I don't know, it was the subject of a PhD thesis, so I won't go into that. But essentially, it, at least to my layman's mind, it attempts to reuse as much as possible of conventional HTTP, including conventional HTTP verbs, and the notion of resources as URLs. Uh, but the disadvantage is the API is ad hoc, which means it's incumbent on you to document it properly. But if you're, a better approach is actually to provide libraries for your users, right? So don't, let I me mean, document the API, but also provide a nice Python binding, provide a nice Ruby binding, provide a nice PHP binding, and so on, as companies, for example, like Stripe do. Um, uh, JSON, JavaScript ob object notation, um, maps very nicely to Python, lists and dictionaries. I say JSON versus XML. Uh, it has built-in Python support and has since 2.6. That's almost four years old now. And a very nice feature, obviously, with JSON is if, if that is your API, then it means it is easy to integrate into the client using JavaScript, right? 
Um, and authentication with uh, REST APIs, it's, it's, not, it's not formalized like it is in the, um, uh, with SOAP. Uh, but a nice technique is to use long randomly generated tokens to make sure you generate at least two so that you can rotate them. And then just use basic HTTP authentication over HTTPS, which is secure, right? If it's HTTPS, it's crypt encrypted, you know, and uh, above your uncle. Uh, logging, very quickly, uh, Amazon Web Services CloudWatch. It's a sort of an EC2 subservice. Uh, it's most useful if you're using EC2 itself because it provides default metrics, for example, CPU usage, disk and I.O. So if your machine goes down, you can set up an alarm to email you or whatever. Uh, I use this logging uh, custom metrics using the Boto library, which is essentially an Amazon Web Services library for Python. But a disadvantage is the API is fairly heavyweight. Um, a service I've been using most more recently is called StatHat. Uh, it's used to track statistics and events. A very, very lightweight API. You can log events from curl or wget. It's very nice. And it provides alarms, graphs, and reports. Um, and then there's you know, the big boys like a new relic and so on as well, or logly. I uh, think you can also use for um, logging. But I mean, for my purposes, these two services are, are working very nicely. And I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, John. Questions? Questions? Thanks, John. Um, Wondering if you've considered using anything like Puppet or Chef to, because you've got all these dependencies and stuff to build to push. Are you looking at any kind of configuration management software or anything like that? Well, I, I mean, I have fairly simple. I basically, the only software running of note on my name service is TinyDNS. Right, so I set that up once and I'm done. I mean, I have to update the database, but that's not a software update per se. And then the other things that tend to be fairly ad hoc, like my query counter. Um, it's, it's a small Go program. I have a couple of Python loggers, right? So I'm not really, right? it, it's, it doesn't tend to be the type of software I need to update. Right? Whereas my, um, the actual slickdns.com web server, I update essentially by doing HG pull from the repository. So, so I'm not saying they're not good, they are good things to use, I'm sure, but I don't need them. I haven't seen the need for them myself. Apart, for me, plain old fabric works fine, basically. So, yeah. So, I, I just don't know. That's, you know, ask someone else about Puffet or Chef. I, I don't have a, an intelligent opinion. I was just going to say we started using uh, something called Salt, which um, is like those other tools, but it's a Python one that's uh, new and pretty heavily developed. So I ask these guys. Sorry, I, I can't. I can't answer that question. Other questions? Uh, could you please expand on the evils of soap and why rest is um, preferred? <laughs> oh, it's a whole. I, I, I guess if you're. Uh, um, well, you should read, read the, the essay, almost a polemic. Uh, S stands for simple. I, I, I suppose the promise of SOAP was that it should provide an interoperable, auto-discoverable API. But in practice, that very often is not the case. Um, it's just that I found, I, I have worked on SOAP APIs, I just found the tooling, when it works, works very well, or it can work very well, when it doesn't work, Extremely painful because I, I remember I was trying to debug one API with, and I was using Suds, which is a Python. I'm not blaming Suds. It's a Python library basically for introspecting um, a WSDL. And never mind WSDL if you don't know what that means. Um, it, no, it's only expected a WSDL document generated the the uh, library and tried to run, and then it broke. And then I turned on the debugging flag, and I sort of stopped counting it after one million lines. Right, so obviously it wasn't going to get me very far. So I'm saying so in the, in the right environment, like I think especially if you're in the so-called enterprise world with, say, Visual Studio or um, 
um, or the Java world, if you have tools that can introspect the WSDL and generate the API for you and it works, you're golden. But if it doesn't work, then I just find that the APIs are very difficult to manually inspect and to make work yourself. Right? Whereas the REST API, again, the onus is on the provider to document it properly. Right? So that is the trade-off. But I find that with the REST API, it's very easy to build a wrapper manually if it's properly documented. Because you're starting from much simpler tools, namely standard uh, HTTP verbs and plain old URLs. And then a simple payload, like well, back in the day it would have been XML. Nowadays, more so uh, JSON. So. I mean, it, it's really your market. If you're after the enterprise, basically SOAP is mandated. But if I'm not going after the enterprise market, right? So in that case, I'm going to provide a, a, a REST API and I'll provide libraries for my clients. Right? If they want SOAP, I'll say, thanks, Manuel, thanks. <laughs> Go here. So. Oh. I, I do it by hand. I, I think I have heard of, I, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but there is a tool out there that will apparently introspect Django models and generate an API for you. Uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head if you Google. But to my mind, it, it, doesn't, nece it doesn't necessarily make for a very clean API. Like if you look at the Stripe API, which for example is not usable necessarily from Australia for legal reasons, but if you just look at the documentation of the Stripe API, it's very, very nice. And I can't imagine the auto generated that. So, so that really is the trade-off. REST APIs tend to be ad hoc. Um, but they're not hard. It was just plain old views, right? If method dot equals get or put or delete, then do this, that, and the other thing. So it's not hard in Django. Um, unfortunately, we are basically out of time. Um, could everyone please thank John again? Thank you.